Hi, this is Robert Roberg. I call myself the Mount Spokane Poet. I grew up in the United States of North America, up in the Pacific Northwest in Washington State, in the city of Spokane, population 200,000, at the foot of Mount Spokane. In high school, I wrote a poem about wanting to commit suicide on the mountain's breast. It was called The Mountain. The poem was published in the school's literary magazine, Esprit. In the poem, I have a conversation with the mountain about failure. The mountain tells me it too is a failure. By the end of the poem, the mountain convinces me to live. The opening lines were, I trudged along the lake shore, listened to the lake. The waves that quiet morning were angry, discontent. Mount Spokane has played a role throughout my life. It is one of the tallest peaks in the inland northwest, 5,888 feet. The Native Americans who were living there when the Europeans invaded called themselves Spokans, children of the sun. They called the mountain Little Sun Mountain. They have a legend that once there was an earthquake and the Little Sun Mountain grew big overnight. Many poets are defined by the region, so I have chosen to call myself the Mount Spokane poet. When I was about 12 years old, I read my first poem and I liked it a lot. Trees by Joyce Kilmer. I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the sweet earth's flowing breast, a tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray, a tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Joyce Kilmer's poem touched me. Sadly, he was killed in World War I. When I entered John Zegger Preparatory School at age 14, I was told that my favorite poem was not poetry, but doggerel. Most of the high school boys hated poetry, but because of Kilmer, I was eager to learn. That's when I was introduced to Robert W. Service and his exciting poems about the rough and tumble life of gold miners in early Alaska. I can still almost recite by rote his poem, The Creation of Sam McGee. There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake LaBarge. I cremated Sam McGee. He moved to Canada as a young man, where he became famous for his poetry. He was known as the Poet of the Yukon. He died in 1958. My English teachers at Gonzaga Prep introduced me to Robert Frost, and he became my favorite. Whose woods are these? I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farm near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Frost had quite an influence on me. He said writing poetry without rhyme is like playing tennis without a net. I don't think all poetry should rhyme, but it's quite amazing how rhyming words find each other and give more life to a sentence. Frost was born in 1874 and died in 1963. He was the only poet to receive four Pulitzer Prizes. When I was 17, I discovered the Beat Poets of San Francisco. I loved Lawrence Ferlinghetti's poems and reluctantly tried to read Allen Ginsberg. Ferlinghetti was born in 1919 and is still alive today as I write this in 2020. Here's one of his poems I like. The world is a beautiful place to be born into, 
if you don't mind happiness not always being so very much fun, if you don't mind a touch of hell now and then, just when everything is fine, because even in heaven they don't sing all the time, the world is a beautiful place to be born into, if you don't mind some people dying all the time, or maybe only starving some of the time, which isn't half bad if it isn't you. Oh, the world's a beautiful place to be born into. If you don't mind much a few dead minds in the higher places, or a bomb or two now and then in your upturned faces, or such improprieties as our brand name society is to pray to. With its men of distinction and its men of extinction and its priests and other patrolmen, and its various segregations and congressional investigations and other constipations that our fool flesh is heir to. Yes, the world is the best place of all for a lot of such things as making the fun scene, making the love scene, making the sad scene, singing in low songs and having inspirations and walking around looking at everything and smelling flowers and goosing statues, and even thinking and kissing people and making babies and wearing pants and waving hats and dancing and going swimming in rivers or picnics in the, midst, in the middle of the summer or just generally living it up. Yes, but then right in the middle of it comes the smiling mortician. Here's a fragment by Allen Ginsberg from his poem Howl. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves to the Negro streets at dawn, looking for an angry fix. Angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo in the machinery of night, who poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats, floating across the tops of city contemplating jazz, who bared their brains to heaven under the L and saw Mohammedan angels staggering on tenement roofs illuminated who passed through universities with radiant eyes, hallucinating Arkansas and Blake Light tragedy among the scholars of war, who were expelled from the academies for crazy and publishing obscene odes on the windows of the skull, who cowered in unshaven rooms in underwear, burning their money in wastebaskets and listening to the terror through the wall, who got busted in their public beards returning from Laredo with a belt of marijuana for New York, who ate fire paint hotels, or drank turpentine in Paradise Alley, death, or purgatory their torsos night and day, who dreams of drugs with waking nightmares, alcohol. Later, I learned most of the Beats met in 1944 in New York City and migrated to San Francisco. Some say they gave birth to the hippie movement. They definitely gave a new birth to my poetry. I actually met Ginsburg in Grand Central Station in New York years later, and he invited me to travel with him. I didn't like Shakespeare's poetry, but his words about missing an opportunity still resonate in my brain when I think about what Ginsburg offered. Here's what Shakespeare said. There is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on fortune, omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are they now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. Ginsburg was born in 1926 and died in 1944. When I reached Gonzaga University, I was introduced to early American poets. I never did get Walt Whitman's ramblings. I did like the drumbeat in Longfellow's Hiawatha, but that was about all. No early American poets interested me. In fact, until Edgar Allan Poe, 1809 to 1849, poetry in America was pretty bleak. Poe, with his fascination with death and ability to make enticing rhythms, excited me. Here's his poem called Annabelle Lee. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee and this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me I was a child and she was a child 
in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than a love. I and my Annabelle Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea a wind blew out of a cloud chilling my Annabelle Lee so that her high-born kinsmen came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of a cloud by night, chilling my Annabelle Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demons down under the sea, can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so all the night tide I lay down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride in the sepulchre there by the sea in her tomb by the sounding sea. This poem with its musical cadence really hit me. Poe was a master of cadence and rhythm. I'm not sure anyone has ever done better. Following on the heels of Poe was James Whitcomb Riley. The only way I knew him was that my Irish grandfather, Frank Dean, would often light a fire in his fireplace and turn out all the lights and recite it to us when we were bad little children. It's called Little Orphan Danny. Little Orphan Danny's come to our house to stay and wash the cups and saucers up and brush the crumbs away and shoo the chickens off the porch and dust the hearth and sweep and make the fire and bake the bread and earn her board and keep and all us other children when the supper things is done we'd set around the kitchen fire and has the mostest fun and listen to the witch's tales that Annie tells about and the goblins will get you if you don't watch out once there was a little boy who wouldn't say his prayers, so when he went to bed at night away upstairs, his mammy heard him holler, his daddy heard him shout. And when they turned the covers back, he wasn't there at all. And they seeked him in the rafter room and cubby hole and press, and seeked him up the chimney flue and everywhere, I guess. But all they ever found was this his pants and roundabout. And the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. Once a time a little girl would always laugh and grin and make fun of everyone and all her blood and kin. And once when they was company and old folks was there, she mocked them and shocked them and said she didn't care. Just as she kicked her heels and turned to run and hide, they was two great big black things a standing by her side. And they snatched her through the ceiling for she knowed what she's about. And the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. And little orphan Danny says when the blaze is blue and the lamp wick sputters and the wind goes woo and you hear the crickets quit and the moon is gray and the lightning bugs and dew is all squenched away you better mind your parents and your teachers fond and dear and cherish them that loves you and dry the orphan's tear and help the poor needy ones that clusters all about or the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. This poem sent chills up my spine. One of my favorite poems from early America is Emily Dickens, 1830 to 1866. 
Dickinson was a recluse and lived in isolation. 1,800 poems were found after her death. She was a precursor to 20th century poetry, for her poems were short, often without titles, with unusual punctuation, capillation, and slant rhymes. Here's one called, I Could Not Stop for Death. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. He carries help but just ourselves and immortality. The editors of the Gonzaga University Literary Journal also taught me a lot of poetry, about poetry. They rejected everything I submitted with rhyme. I learned to write without rhyming, and they finally published some of my poems. My senior year, I won the William T. Costello Prize for Poetry. I had Franz Snyder for an English teacher, and he introduced me to the modern European poets. The European poets had abandoned rhyme and were very pessimistic. Perhaps their depression was because Europeans had come out of two devastating world wars. The last poet that finished my education was E. E. Cummings. He was educated at Cambridge Latin School and at Harvard College, where in 1915 he received his A.B. graduating magna cum laude in Greek and English. He received his M.A. from Harvard in 1960. Cummings untied the straitjacket of poetry and let all the rules escape the asylum. Here are some of Cummings' poems. Buy me an ounce and I'll sell you a pound. Turn and get spin, Helen the slimmer. The finger the thicker, the dumber it swirls, girls. Round and round. Early to the better is wiser or worse. Give his take, Tommy, we ordered a steak and they send us a pie. It's try, boys, mine is yours. Ask me the name of the moon and the man. Up, Sam, down. Alice, a hole in the ocean will never be missed. It's in, girls, yours and mine. Neither was deafer than neither was dumb. Skip fried jumped Nettie but under the wonder is under the wise. It's how boys, here we come. This is my favorite poem by E. E. Cumming, In Just Spring. In Just Spring, when the world is muddleicious, little lame balloon man whistled far and wee. And Eddie and Bill came running with marbles and piracies, and it's spring when the world is puddle wonderful. The quaint old balloon man whistles far and wee, and Betty and Isabel come dancing from hopscotch and jump rope. And it's spring, and the goat-footed balloon man whistles far and wee. The thing about Cummings was he sometimes broke words apart and wrote vertically. Here's another one of his poems. Anyone lived in a pretty howl town, with up so and many bells down, spring, summer, autumn, winter. He sang his didn't, he danced his did. Women and men, both little and small, cared for anything not at all. They sowed their isn't, they reaped their same. Sun, moon, stars, rain. Children guessed, but only a few. And down they forgot as up they grew. Autumn, winter, spring, summer. That no one loved him more by more. When by now in a tree by leaf, she laughed his joy, she cried his grief. Bird by snow and stir by still. Anyone's any was all to her. Someone's married their every ones, laughed their crimes and did their dance, sleep, awake, hope, and then they said their nevers, they slept their dream, stars, rain, sun, moon, and only the snow can begin to explain how children are apt to forget to remember, was so uproading many bells down. One day, anyone died, I guess, and no one stopped to kiss his face. This is another one by Cummings called If. If freckles were lovely and the day was night, and measles were nice and a lie weren't a lie, life would be a delight, but things couldn't go right, for in it's such a sad plight, I wouldn't be I. If earth was heaven and now was hence, and past was present and false was true, there might be some sense, but I'd be in suspense, for on such a pretense you wouldn't be you. I fear was plucking, globes were square, and dirt was cleanly and tears were glee, things would seem fair, yet they'd all despair. For if here was there, we wouldn't be we. I had several changing career goals as I matured. First I wanted to be the Pope, but then I discovered girls. I decided to be the President, later just a Congressman, and just a lawyer. But before I finished high school, I decided I wanted to be a poet. By the time I graduated from Gonzaga University, I felt my knowledge of poet had freed me from what poetry should be. I was freed from constant rhyming, logic, 
grammar, punctuation, and horizontal lines. The only rule in poetry is that there are no rules. The danger is that such poetry could lead to nonsense. Unfortunately, I think that is what happened. As the 20th century went on, I found fewer and fewer poets that I admired. Most of the poetry came from universities and was anemic and soulless babble. Sound and fury signify nothing. There is an inborn desire in humans for meaning. I seek to give some meaning somewhere in every poem that helps someone learn or desire to learn something about life. A good poem should give readers an aha moment, an epiphany, a zen moment. I've always believed in God and want that to come out without being preaching. Over the years, I had a dozen poems published in minor poetry magazines. I was published by the Free River Press in a book called Five Street Poets. I'll put the link down below. I recorded several of my booklets and put them on YouTube. You can listen to them at your leisure. Enjoy. It's uh, youtube.com slash c slash robertrobert slash videos. I'll put the link down.